It's Monday. You know what that means? It's time for Cross Defense. This is the show where we equip the mind, we ignite the imagination, and we comfort the soul with God's word. We have a fierce enemy out there seeking to devour us. Our only defense, our only defense, is Christ on the cross. Christ crucified for the forgiveness of our sins. He is our victory. That is where he got the job done and saved us. It is wonderful to be with you today. I am Tyrell Bramwell. I was the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California. You've heard me say that in the weeks past. I am now, well, currently without a job. I am on my way making the transition to Fort Wayne, Indiana, Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, Indiana. I have accepted a call to serve as an admission counselor out there to help men and women who are considering the pastoral office or the an office as a deaconess, help them figure that out and uh, make their way through the system and uh, get well-trained and prepared to serve out in God's harvest field, out in the pasture, to take care of his sheep and to reach the lost. And so I'm going to be doing that kind of work. So the next time you hear my voice, the next show will be broadcast from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Today is my final episode from the Victorian village of Ferndale, California, with the great people at St. Mark Lutheran Church. It has been a blessing to serve this congregation. All right, what do we got going on today? Did you guys see these uh, pamphlets that Concordia Publishing House has been publishing? They are, it's a series of pamphlets. A Simple Explanation is the name of the series. And they are 32 pages about, I think all of them are roughly around that long. And um, they talk about different parts of the church life. And uh, a few new ones came out, one of which is this simple explanation of fellowship in the Lord's Supper. And I want to draw your attention to this one because it deals with closed communion and also because I have intimate knowledge of the content of this pamphlet as I was the guy who wrote it. It was an honor uh, to do so and to be able to try to briefly explain why closed communion is biblical and why it is a loving thing, even though it can be this controversial thing. We all know, or maybe you don't, maybe you don't know this, but closed communion can be controversial. Some people find it to be offensive that we would say no to someone who's trying to come up to the rail and take communion. That can be a very offensive thing. And we need to recognize that, and I, I do recognize that, and in this pamphlet, I deal with it and try to explain why, uh, even though it's uncomfortable sometimes, it is the faithful thing to do. So stick around to the end of the episode. At the end, I will tell you how you can receive a copy of this for free. Uh, CPH sent me a packet. These come, all of these, in when you buy them, come in a packet of 20 for about $10 at Concordia Publishing House, cph.org. And I got I got a packet of 20 and just they just arrived. I'm going to give half that pack away. I'm going to give 10 people, the first 10 people to do something. I am going to uh, give them a copy. So stick around to the end of this show, and I'll tell you what you got to do to be one of those 10 people. You got to be quick. You got to be you got to be quick about it to uh, get a copy sent to you. It doesn't mean much. It means nothing actually. But if you want, I'll even sign the silly thing and drop it in the mail. And I'll get it to you. But you got to stick around to the end of the show to find out how to get your copy. That's what's coming your way. Before we actually take a look at the fellowship of the Lord's Supper, if you don't know what else is uh, covered in this series of pamphlets, let me uh, let me just, I'm over at Concordia Publishing House's website. The new ones, there's three new ones, two more in addition to a simple explanation of fellowship in the Lord's Supper. The other two are uh, church and state, simple ex explanation of church and state, and uh, the church year, a simple explanation of the church year. Both of those are extremely good to know, especially that church and state, right? What a better time, could there be a better time, I should say, to study, to get a little refresher on church and state than right now with COVID stuff going on, right? We have, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news, but gathering for church has been sort of a hot topic because 
the uh, civil government is saying churches shouldn't gather and the ecclesial arena says what we need to gather the lord says to gather it's it's what we do to be built up and strengthened and to have our faith nourished in this time especially in covid this time of of great fear and trepidation we need that and the lord says to do it and so who do we listen to there's the church and state issue going on right there and so this is a great time to order your pack of 20 of those and get a little refresher on that and then also you know the the church year maybe we should do an episode on that you guys will have to remind me but on the church year, the, uh, the the calendar and our observations of feast days and festivals, you know, high festival days and things like that, I have a theory, and this is why it'd probably be its own episode. I have this theory that you can tell a lot about someone's heart, about their their God, based on the calendar they keep. And I, I think we got to be careful here because some of us are just going through the motions. We're keeping the calendar that our society keeps. But we've seen an increase in our secular calendar and a decrease in the observation of the church calendar. There are many Christians today who don't even know certain holy days, certain holidays. They're, they're foreign to them because as a, a church in this modern Western world of ours, we don't observe all the holidays that we used to observe. Instead, in, in its place, we observe many of the secular holidays and many of the the Christian churches holidays have been you know co-opted and made part of the secular calendar so there's this overlap but anyway let's talk about that in a whole other episode that'd be good stuff to talk about it's exciting and maybe I'll wait till after I order my pack of 20 of that little packet so I know what um, at least the basics of what that packet says and if you order it before I do well just let me know what it says and if uh, I should put a rush on my order other ones that are already out, other simple explanations that are already available. Baptism, great stuff. Uh, Lutheranism, just in general, Lutheranism, ah, oh, that'd be awesome. A simple explanation of heaven and hell, very intriguing. There's one on Holy Communion, not to be confused with this one on uh, fellowship in the Lord's Supper. This one is specifically dealing with closed communion, like who communes together, where the other one is dealing with communion in general, the sacrament of communion. The, uh, the image of God and gender and sexual identity. That'd be another great one to take a look at in this day and age. A simple explanation of Christian denominations. Now, this is part of why closed communion is such a uh, needed practice, why the Lord implemented it. Uh, we'll get into that maybe in the next segment, I'm maybe, maybe by the end of the show, I hope. If I forget, <laughs> well, just call me out on it in the a comment on the social media or something, let me know. But there are something like 40,000, thousand, 40,000 plus denominations in Christendom, churches that bear the name Christ. And that's not counting you know, the cults and things that use Jesus in their name, but Christian denominations, 40,000 plus today in the world. That's a lot of denominations. So there's a simple explanation of Christian denominations. I'm sure it doesn't go into all 40,000. It's actually, uh, let's see, the easy-to-use compact booklet features brief summaries of 16 Christian denominations, summaries that will provide readers with a better understanding of each denomination's differences. So it's probably going to take up the big ones that we're more, most familiar with. But there's, uh, there's all these different denominations out there. You know, a guy, a guy doesn't want to teach what the church has been teaching. He just goes off and starts his own church, and before you know it, it's an entire denomination. It's, it's really a mess out there. But uh, what else we got? The church service, a simple explanation of the church service, the liturgy, and these wonderful gifts that we've, we've uh, received from the Lord as he gives us his word. And then a simple explanation of Christianity. That's probably where you want to start. And uh, that, if my memory serves, yeah, that is the catechism. And it is probably what started this whole trend. These, these things are small, like 32 pages, because the catechism, the small catechism is not a large document. The, uh, the questions and answers that go with it make it a book, but uh, really it's just a pamphlet. And so you can get that in English or Spanish is what the website is showing. So good deal. Okay, well, um, let's dive into this pamphlet, this one, and talk about closed communion. The oh-so-controversial topic of closed communion. Let's, let's use that other packet, that other little packet pamphlet about denominations. Let's use that as sort of a jumping off point to get started. There is a 
40,000 plus denominations. And there, there's divisions in the church for a reason. What is that reason? It's, it's not a great reason. It's, it's, I'm not celebrating it. I'm just observing it. Because those denominations exist because this is, uh, there's distinctions in teaching. When you drive down the street in your town, you see different churches on different corners, and they have different names, right? They all have different signs. They have uh, logos and, and identifying marks that tell you it's part of uh, this thing, but not part of that thing, like the LCMS, right? When you see the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, Trinity Cross, the, the threefold cross there, you recognize it. It's very recognizable. And uh, we even use that as a sign to tell people who are coming to town, like there's an LCMS church this direction. Go this way. Go that way. Um, but there's also other churches with their signs because every church is teaching something different. That's why there's so many different denominations. There's a reason we're not all in fellowship. There's a, we're not all the same. We're not all equal. There are things that are being taught in one that very overtly contradict the other. And to say we're all the same and to dismiss those differences is not a safe practice. It's not good for anybody. You got to own the differences. I don't know what the world is teaching us these days, but we got to own our differences and, and acknowledge them. And those who hold to the thing they hold to, they need to claim it, to own it, and then to dialogue honestly with the other people about theirs to reach fellowship. Don't just pretend it doesn't exist, right? Okay, so let's talk divisions. In this pamphlet, I write, Truth be told, closed communion is often a point of tension in the church. The church is fractured into many denominations, which means there are a variety of different teachings out there. Among these differences, we find confessions that are, that are at odds with one another. It's for this reason that closed communion is not merely a Christian, non-Christian matter, but also considers the divisions among those who bear Christ's name. It's ultimately a matter of fellowship. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul addressed Christian divisions with respect to communion when he delivered pastoral instruction to those in Corinth who were abusing the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, 17-21 But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. Communion is not about everyone doing what is right in his own eyes. Deuteronomy 12. Eight. See, the, one of the things we, we think about when we talk about closed communion, and you think about people coming up to take communion, right? And they say you're, you're at a church and someone is visiting with you and they belong to another church body, a different denomination that teaches and believes different things, but they're now with you and they want to they, they want to come and receive communion. They, they say they're Christian. You say you're Christian. Uh, they feel like they want to participate, but this is an event that makes them um, not sure even how to go through with it. What, what's the procedure? What's the right? And they're going to do what they want to do based on what they're feeling in that moment, based on their ideas and their inclinations. And this is dealt with in Deuteronomy 12.8. We're not to be going around doing what we see as, as right in our own eyes. We're not the ultimate uh, perceivers of truth. We're not the ones who, I should say it this way, we're not the ones who dictate what is truth. God does that. God says this is true. Right? God does. And so we are to follow His way. Not to do things as if it's right in our own eyes, but to do things that are right in God's eyes, whether we like them or not. And, and this is part of the Christian growth. Sometimes we're not comfortable with something at first until we study it and we learn it. And we, we try to get behind why is God doing this and why does He say this? And we come to understand that it's because He loves us. It's always because He loves us. But our perception was skewed. That we were blinded by something, some presupposition we had, some baggage that we were bringing to the table, some ignorance even, right? Which again is not a bad word. 
I, I don't know if I've said that in previous episodes of Cross Defense or not, but ignorance is not a bad word. It is a statement of fact. You don't know something. You're ignorant on that topic. That's all it is. And as we study God's word, we, we realize we're ignorant on a lot of things, and we need God to school us. We need to, to take us to school and teach us what is his will for our lives. And so uh, community is not about everyone doing what is right in his own eyes. Deuteronomy 12, 8. It may be a personal between me and Jesus moment, but it's more than that. It's a communal between me and Jesus and the people with me and Jesus moment. And as we read above, read above, excuse me, it's about waiting for one another in unity. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. In 1 Corinthians 10, Jesus' apostle explains that communion unites those who share the same belief and therefore together receive the elements. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. Everyone who communes together is part of the one body united. In other words, when we partake of communion, we are in communion. Mm. All right, I'm not going to read anymore. I just want to give you a little taste of that uh, pamphlet, a simple explanation of the Lord's Supper. You can order, it's, it's available on Kindle too. I should have said that. You can order packs of 20 for 9.33 right now. So about 10 bucks. I think they're $11 when they're not uh, on sale. And uh, you can get it on Kindle for 99 cents, I think. And um, yeah, so that's just a little taste of that. We're going to talk a lot more about communion for the rest of the show, well, about closed communion even. And come back after the break, and we'll talk specifically about a bad example, how not to do closed communion, and uh, go from there. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Look forward to talking to you in just a second after we get back from this break. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 states, If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Find this true wisdom in Christ on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on Worldwide KFUO. Sharpen the iron of your faith together with two pastors as they take up the sword of the Spirit to proclaim the gifts of Christ crucified and risen for you. All right, we weren't gone very long. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for taking a second to listen to what else is available at KFUO.org. I should have mentioned at the beginning of the show, if you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on all the different social media platforms. I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook, and then on YouTube with all the different videos that I'm putting out, including episodes of Cross Defense, the video format. It's basically just the camera turned on, and I'm talking to the microphone for the radio show, but you can tune in and follow along there. There are special treats that pop up on the screen that you can't see with your ears, which is a little nod to uh, Pastor Kilgo's teaching from last week. But um, yeah, that, that's included in the YouTube version, but really just the same content. And what else? LinkedIn, Twitter, all those sorts of places. And you can email me. You can go to TyrellBramwell.com, and uh, there's a contact form over there, an email contact form, and drop me lines. On that, In fact, that's why I mentioned that I'm moving to Concordia Theological Seminary, because someone asked, they had watched uh, an episode of something, I think it was um, my last homebound uh, service, I, I, not a full service, I record the readings and the sermons and the prayer of the church for people, uh, homebound members, and I use my YouTube channel because it's verified to be able to get it to my congregation members, and in there I mentioned I was preaching my final sermon, and so someone had emailed me using the contact form at Tyrell Bremo bramwell.com i can't even say my own name um asking where i was going and what was going on with that so that's why i led off with that let it makes sense too because you'll be hearing more about that and i'll have i'll have live in-person guests in the proverbial studio with me 
because I'll have access to professors and ordained faculty and staff and things uh, once we get to the seminary. So that'll be cool for you guys. And really, I'm trying to get this show up and running to where I'm comfortable doing it live. So we can open up those listener lines once again for all you listening live, and we can do it that way. So that's going to be exciting too. But uh, go to TyrellBrownwood.com, and while you're there looking at the contact form, you can also find why I ended up writing the simple explanation of fellowship in the Lord's Supper. And that's because of a book I published in 2018 called Come In, We Are Closed, which I thought was a brief explanation of closed communion. But um, I condensed it even further down. But this is unique because it's fiction. I used a little conversation between a, a retired pastor and an ev- evangelical Christian, someone who is a Protestant who is not familiar with closed communion because it ha- it's a practice that, sadly, many in Protestantism are not familiar with, evangelicalism, because, uh, well, back to the church calendar. We don't focus on our history and our calendar, our lectionary, our readings, our teachings. So many things have been downplayed in our mar- modern Western church. And so many people are offended the first time they encounter closed communion. And um, so I wrote a, a book, a fictional book, with a lot of the questions I had when I was coming into the church, when I was that offended evangelical Christian who didn't know anything about the practice of closed communion, and many other things, too, uh, most of them having to do with the means of grace and why God does what he does through external means. I truly was, not even knowing it, uh, I truly was an enthusiast. I was all about, like, it's just spiritual. God doesn't work through means. God doesn't work through the physical. And that's what I thought. And I was so, so wrong. And I learned by asking questions and studying Scripture, bringing what I was taught back to God's Word and analyzing it and studying it and seeking guidance on it and weighing it and praying about it and understanding it. I just got a lot, I got a long way to go for sure, but... That's, uh, these, are, these are the questions I had in this book, Come In, We're Closed, and the answers I was given, and now the answers I, too, give. Uh, some of these answers I have come up with myself, not the answer, but the way in delivering it, and a lot of them are by metaphor, by uh, you know, connecting it to something we do know. So, for example, a wedding rehearsal and going through the practice of the marriage ceremony before the ceremony, right? Communion is very much a wedding rehearsal. It's preparing us for the marriage feast to come as we have the uh, the rehearsal feast every time we go to the Lord's Supper. So you can find that over at my website and you can uh, get a copy of that too. This is also only $10. I wanted it to be cheap so people would order it. And I know some churches have bought this and been giving it away to visitors and things. It's been kind of a blessing to the church. I uh, hope it continues to be. It was a blessing to me to be able to write it. And there's a there's a Bible study over there too. Bible study at TyrellBramwell.com. A brother pastor, Eric Rapp, uh, if you know him and his great musical stylings, uh, he wrote a Bible study for this, which is great. And I formatted it and got it all set up for a download. So you can get a PDF download of that and use that for your entire congregation or for your home study if you'd like, just to grow in your understanding of communion and why we practice it in the closed way instead of the opening open way (laughs) okay so let's shift gears a little bit we're still talking about the closed communion thing but now i want to bring to you another resource i love books guys uh i just want to be able to bring to you the insights that others have have received and who then give to us through their writings on these topics that's one of one of the beautiful things about being a christian we are not in this alone You are not going to come up with something new. You don't have to figure out all this stuff all by yourself. There are many, many faithful, brilliant people who've been wrestling with the same things you're wrestling with, no matter what it is, I guarantee it, and they have written about it. They have communicated it. They have uh, dialogued with it, and they have engaged it. And we have these resources if we're willing to look, and we're willing to listen and learn, and again, bring everything we read that is not Scripture Bring it to Scripture and weigh it against Scripture. And make sure it is faithful. That is always the test. Does it agree with the Holy Bible? If not, it was somebody's idea. It was somebody's wrestling. There might be something 
beneficial in how they engaged it, but ultimately doesn't agree, and so it goes to the uh, doesn't agree pile, and we move on to something else. But this is this is definitely something that agrees. It's wonderful, and, and coincidentally, this is uh, an essay. I'm going to read to you parts of an essay, maybe the whole thing, from We Believe, Essays on the Catechism, which is coincidentally published by Concordia Theological Seminary Press where I'll be going, and published by the now sitting president of Concordia Theological Seminary, hashtag CTSFW, if you're wondering. You can just Google that. Google the hashtag, Instagram the hashtag, Twitter the hashtag. You'll find all kinds of stuff on CTSFW, Concordia Theological Seminary. This is an essay titled Sacrament of the Altar, Christ, Daily Food and Sustenance, written by Professor Lawrence Rast now President and Professor Lawrence Rast. And this is going to give us an example in case anyone thinks that, well, there's open communion and closed communion. Well, there's ways of abusing closed communion too. Closed communion is the biblical way communion is done. It is done among those who are united in the same faith, at the same table of the Lord, not being uh, part of the, the table of the Lord and the table of demons, not conflicting the things and, and merging them and, and muddying everything up, but being of the same faith. This is going to give you insight into what that looks like and what that means and what it doesn't mean. You can you can use closed communion in an abusive way, trying to make it this into something from it's not. Sacrament of the this is going to be Christ an example of. Daily so I don't want anyone out there thinking in the apology of the Augsburg Confession. It's closed, lengthen but noted, but don't abuse it. It is certain right. that don't most people in our is, churches use the sacrament to do. Absolution and the Lord's Supper many times in a year. Less than a decade later, however, Luther painted a strikingly different picture. Now that the people are free from the tyranny of the Pope, they are unwilling to receive the sacrament and they treat it with contempt. Luther bemoaned the situation, yet counseled patient teaching on the part of the pastors in trying to con correct the situation. Here too, he says, there is need of exhortation, but with this understanding, no one is to be compelled to believe or to receive the sacrament. No law is to be made concerning it. No law. We got to understand this. I hope I hope you take this away from this show. If if nothing else, maybe take this away. Close communion. Sometimes we approach it as if it's man-made, as if the church body that practices it invented it, set it up, or adopted it from another church body. Uh uh. Nope. Closed communion is not a law that we made to go with communion. We're not allowed to do that. It is the last will and testament of our Lord. We cannot add to or take away from what he says. This is not a man-made addition to how communion is celebrated. It's part of Christ's institution. But it be done among those who believe. Believe what he says. That they're sinners in need of forgiveness and that this is truly his body and blood given to them for the remission of their sins, right? So not a law. We need, to, we need to know that and kind of dwell on that for a second. We should so preach that of their own accord and without any law, the people will desire the sacrament and, as it were, compel us pastors to administer it to them. So the people are to want it. We're not supposed to force them into it or force them out of it. There's no law, but they want it and they are to say, give it to us, give it to us. Okay, so President Rass continues, Luther's comments sound remarkably contemporary for many pastors hope to achieve these very things. Yet there seems to be a disconnect of sorts between pastors and people. All of us who have served in the parish have heard the responses from our people. Having communion more often would make it less special, quote unquote. I am not prepared for receiving the sacrament every Sunday, quote unquote, and the like. What happened? Well, Luther blamed it on enthusiasm, the idea that God deals with human beings apart from his word and sacraments. In the small called articles, he reserves some of his strongest language for a condemnation of the enthusiasm that he believes clings to every human being. So why is it that so many of Luther's heirs have lost his perspective on this point? A partial explanation lies in the historical and theological development of Lutheranism. Simply put, 
The enthusiasm Luther feared found its way directly into Lutheran theology and practice and remains with us in the present. Following Luther's death in 1546, various Lutheran theologians attempted to quote-unquote complete Luther's reforming work. One significant group later called Pietists and led by Philip Jacob Spanner, 1635-1705, believed that while Luther had taught justification by grace through faith more clearly than anyone since Paul, he had not succeeded in wedding that doctrine with a vigorous practice. Worse yet, they claimed that of some of Luther's followers, the so-called Orthodox, endangered the Lutheran confessions by overemphasizing the means of grace. That the mere reception of the sacraments guaranteed God's favor. Spainer argued that though such a faith is a fleshly illusion, there are not a few who think that all Christianity requires of them is that they be baptized, hear the preaching of God's word, confess and receive absolution, and go to the Lord's Supper, no matter how their hearts are disposed at the time. You hear that? Spainer, a pietist, tried to say that it was wrong to believe that all that it takes to be a Christian, all that's required of a Christian, is that they be baptized, hear the preaching of God's word, confess their sins, receive absolution for their sins, and go to the Lord's Supper. That is it, guys. Don't mishear me. If you're just tuning in, you heard part of that sentence. That's all that there is to being a Christian. That's it. Right? No matter how their hearts are disposed of the time, it doesn't matter how your heart's disposed of the time. You could be feeling horrible. You could be completely distracted. You could be in the pit. You could be over the moon. Your emotions are fickle. They're, they go up and down. They ebb and flow. God's word is always constant. Objective. True. Plumb. Straight. Solid. Firm. In contrast, true Christianity, back in the reading here, according to pietism, centers on the inner life of the believing Christian, the establishment and cultivation of the mystical union between the believer and Christ. Our whole Christian religion, this is a quote, our whole Christian religion consists of the inner man or the new man whose soul is faith and whose expressions are the fruits of life. And all sermons should be aimed at this. Not surprisingly then, Pietism's reason for receiving the sacrament of the altar differs radically from Luther's biblical teaching. For pietism, Dr. Rast says, for pietism, the body and blood of Christ, while really present, are chiefly pledges and signs that move the Christian to a fuller expression of godliness. What they do to more fully express their godliness. Right? You catching that? Thus, Spainer downplays God's objective promises realized in the present Christ. He stresses instead the experience of the human participant. What you experience when you go to the altar is what the pietist is emphasizing. What Christianity emphasizes is not, it's not about your feelings. It's not about you feeling like you want to take communion right now because you just heard a pastor preach a good sermon. So you've never really been to this church before, but you felt good. And so you go to the rail. No, 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 no. That's not what's going on. It's not about feeling saved. It's not about feeling forgiven or feeling unforgiven. It's not about what you feel in the experience. It's about the truth. Objective reality. What is happening? Right? That's it externally from without outside of you now listen to this part this is a quote it is not enough that we hear the word with our outward ear but we must let it penetrate to our heart this is the pietists viewpoint so that we may hear the holy spirit speak there that is with vibrant emotion and comfort feel the sealing of the spirit and the power of the word nor is it enough to be baptized huh but the i that's that's me not the pietist the huh but the inner man, where we have put on Christ in baptism, must also keep Christ on and bear witness to him in our outward life. Nor is it enough to have received the Lord's Supper externally, but the inner man must truly 
be fed with that blessed food. Nor again, is it enough? There's a lot of stuff in here he's putting that's not enough. Scripture doesn't say any of this stuff. Nor is it enough to worship God in an external temple, but the inner man worships God best in his own temple. What? Whether or not he is in an external temple at the time. Do you catch that? It doesn't matter if you're at church at the altar where Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I am in their presence till the end of the age. It doesn't matter if he says, go, don't fail to go to church like is the habit of some. It doesn't matter if he said, here is where I give you my body and blood. I have attached it to these elements to be distributed to you right now. It doesn't matter where you're at in the church as long as in your inner temple, that is your heart, your innermost being, you could be on the beach or in a forest or looking out at a soaring eagle. There, you're worshiping rightly, if you are indeed worshiping rightly. And that's going to get confusing. How do I know? Ah, because I feel it. My emotion is soaring like that eagle over the hilltop, mountaintop, right? Never a hilltop. That's too, that's not soaring enough. We got to be over the, you know, the peak of the mountain. Yeah, no, that's, that's totally false. That's not true at all. That's pietism, and that's not right. Thus, for Spainer and pietism generally, the word and the sacraments are effective only to the person who faithfully believes and accepts them. So then, the sacrament is only valid based on you. You make it effective or ineffective. I don't know about you, but not many things in life work that way. I don't really make something anything. Well, I guess if that door, if it's wood, but if I don't want it to be wood, it's not wood. If this microphone here, if I want it to be you know, something else, I'm just gonna, it just is, if I want it to be. If I don't want it to be made of metal and plastic and foam and condensers and all this kind of microphone-y stuff, it just stops being that? What does it start being? A jellyfish? If I want it to be? What works like this? What works like this? I don't understand. Okay, now here's, here's the bad example, right? We're already building up to it, but here's the bad example of closed communion from the pietists. This is what Dr. Rast writes. By emphasizing the preparedness and faithfulness of man, later pietists effectively barred believer, believers from the Lord's table. The supper was off limits to all except those deemed sufficiently spiritual. August Herman Frank, 1663 to 1727, put it like this. This then, beloved in the Lord Jesus, is the pure and unblemished worship in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ, considered according to a threefold duty toward oneself, toward one's neighbor, and toward God, and consisting in the practice of the same through the power of the Spirit. Now, enter into your hearts... And observe there your circumstances in regard to this threefold duty. So go ahead right now, listeners. Enter into your hearts. If you're driving down the freeway in St. Louis, please pull over before you enter into your hearts. <laughs> enter, I think it just means to reflect on the state of your heart or something like that to put a gracious reading on it. Enter into your hearts and observe there your circumstances in regard to this threefold duty. See how far you have progressed in them or how far you have not progressed. And if you do not wish to deceive yourself, you must admit that it is clear that your present Christian state does not yet merit the name of a righteous beginning. What help is there for us then if we always consider our worship to consist in at a certain time going to confession and the Lord's Supper and yet always live according to our old manner? Ooh. So, you have, to, you have to be a righteous person before you can take communion. To be worthy of receiving the Lord's Supper, you have to be righteous already, sinless already. Well, isn't that what communion's for? To forgive my sins because I'm not righteous apart from Christ crucified for the forgiveness of my sins? Yes, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. All right, take a second, decompress. We'll dive deep into closed communion when we get back from this break.
Concord Matters is the program where we seek to be of one mind that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, Christ-confessing Concordians read through and discuss the Book of Concord, which is our Lutheran confession of faith drawn from Holy Scripture, so that you too may be of one mind and confess with Christ. Be sure to listen every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central on KFUO Radio or anytime on KFUO.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. Until we convene for Concord again, keep confessing, church. Okay, so before the break, we were talking pietism and a bad example of closed communion, how to use it to abuse Christians, right? That you have to be of a the perfect spiritual acumen before you can receive the Lord's Supper. You have to be growing in your journey toward heaven, righteous enough, according to some sort of man-made law, I suppose, some sort of metric of measurement. Then, if, if you can achieve that, hmm, keeping the law, and then eventually you can receive the Lord's Supper. Well, that doesn't sound very biblical, does it? No, it doesn't. Let's see what President Rass has to say about that. What would Luther say to all of this? He writes, The Lord's Supper is not founded on the holiness of men, either the officiating priest or the receiving layperson, but on the word of God. For Luther, the Lord's Supper is about the presence of the gracious Christ who gives forgiveness of sins, light and life. Amen. It is about the work of Christ for us, not an act of our obedience to him. It is God's application of an external, excuse me, Alien righteousness to sinners in need of forgiveness. Completely opposite of what the later pietists tried to say, which was built out of Lutheranism. They, they took it and went somewhere completely wrong. Right? They tried to say that it was internal. That it was all happening in your inner heart that you had to enter into. Right? Remember? Christ for us. It is, this is what he says, it is God's application of an external, alien, that is foreign to our being, righteousness to sinners in need of forgiveness. The Lord's Supper is given as a daily food and sustenance to comfort the person whose heart feels so sorely pressed. If you want any feeling going on in your heart to know if you should take communion, it's when your heart is sorely pressed. It is when you are convicted. It's when you're feeling like you are a sinner. And you're guilty when that conscience is sticking you, right? When it's raw because of sin. That's when you need communion, especially. Should we choose to follow the path of the pietists back into the essay, we will become self-engrossed and miss the gracious promise that Christ has for us. And even if we don't feel like receiving the Lord's Supper, Luther advises, if you cannot feel the need, see, he says, it's not about feeling. If you cannot feel the need, at least believe the scriptures, which tell us that the supper gives us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. For if you choose to fix your eye on how good and pure you are, you will never go. Huh. Thus, he is truly worthy and well-prepared who believes these words. Now, this is, this is right here. Here it is, guys. This is what it takes to be able to take communion, to be in fellowship with one another. Boiled down right here. He is truly worthy and well-prepared who believes these words for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Do you believe you're a sinner? Do you believe that this is Christ's body and blood for you? That's the person who's well, well prepared and worthy to receive it. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, not ourselves. In reality, pietism's overemphasis on man necessarily leads to enthusiasm, which makes God work through non-external, non-physical means, right? It's all spiritual. It replaces Christ with the human subject. This is and will always be the danger of, for we human beings. Better instead to heed Luther's warning 
Enthusiasm clings to Adam and his descendants from the beginning to the end of the world. It is a poison implanted and inoculated in man by the old dragon, and it is the source, strength, and power of all heresy. Accordingly, we should and must constantly maintain that God will not deal with us except through external word and sacrament. This is how God chooses to work. He works through his creation. It's what he wants to do. He made it. He wants to work through it. He chooses to work through means. Whatever is attributed to the Spirit, this is great. Whatever is attributed to the Spirit, apart from such word and sacrament, is of the devil. From the small called articles. So if you have a feeling, but that feeling is not taking you to the word, and it dismisses water in baptism and and the the bread and wine of communion and receiving the the gifts of Christ's body and blood in with and under that bread and wine if it, if it's taking it away from hearing your pastor speak to you the the loving words of forgiveness that you've been absolved after you physically confess your sins to the Lord if it takes you away from a pulpit where you're hearing where you would hear a pastor preach and off into the woods to enter into your own heart in meditation. That is not what God instituted. That is not Christ's way. That is of the devil. Listen also to Luther's advice. I go to the sacrament of the altar, not on the strength of my own faith, but on the strength of Christ's word. I may be strong or weak. I leave that in God's hands, whether I'm strong or weak. This I know, however, that he has commanded me to go eat and drink, etc., Hmm. That's what God said to do. Go, eat, drink. And that he gives me his body and blood. He will not lie or deceive me. The crucified and risen Christ is really present to us in this daily food and sustenance so that we might have life and have it to the full. John 10.10 10. Well done, Dr. Rast, as if you needed my accolade. But there it is. That was great stuff. On uh, for our purposes today, on a bad way of doing closed communion, right? The Pietists were doing uh, a closed communion that was horrible. They're, they closed off the table until you were able to be Christian enough, as if that was possible. Let me tell you what being a Christian is: recognizing you're a sinner, okay, admitting that that you trespass, that you break God's law repenting, and then relying solely, completely, utterly, totally on Jesus to do everything for you. That's being a Christian. Recognizing, I will never live a righteous life, not even righteous enough to receive the Lord's Supper. <laughs> not even righteous enough to think about receiving the Lord's Supper. I am such a sinful person. I need all, all of it to be Jesus doing for me. Thankfully, that's how it's done. That's how the Lord gets things done. So um, I bring that up, and I, I really want to dwell on this during this segment and previous segment, that that's not what we're talking about when we talk about closed communion. What we talk about with closed communion is that we're all in fellowship with one another, um, that, that we recognize the divisions and that there's different teachings, and that there is a truth. We're not doing things man the man-made way, man's way. We're not following after this denominational leader, that congregational pastor. We're not following after men. We're listening to the Lord, to Jesus and his way and doing what he says. And he says to believe in him. He says that you have to be a sinner before you can take it, right? That this is for the forgiveness of sins. He said that this is my body and blood, that the bread and wine, is his body and blood. He says it. To receive it, we also learn from Scripture that to receive it without believing that is to do harm to yourself. To receive it to your detriment. That is what it says. Take a listen to the large catechism. In case you're thinking that still after we've kind of briefly talked on this, 
I, I, I got to say this real quick. I didn't realize how quickly an hour would go when I first started doing this show. These three segments fly by. I feel like we barely get our feet wet. So if you ever want to go deeper into a topic, just tell tell me, you know, direct message me or uh, you know, shoot me an email or something. Tell me, hey, let's revisit that. Let's go a little deeper. That kind of stuff will help me. Send me some sort of feedback. Let me know so we can dig a little deeper on particulars of these things we're talking about, especially in these early weeks as we're getting started. But okay, so back where we were. Take take a listen here to large catechism in case you're thinking that. Closed communion is a modern Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod thing or or an American thing or just, uh, you know, what those pastors do over in that part of the world or that circuit or, or that congregation, but not your congregation or blah, 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 blah. Right. Listen to this. This is part of our heritage from, uh, well, we know that Jesus had it this way. Like this is what's intended by what Paul says, that we can take communion to our detriment. We are to be good stewards, pastors, that is, are to be good stewards of the mysteries of God, the sacraments of our Lord. And so we, we, it goes back to Scripture. But in case you were thinking that it was not a Lutheran thing from the word go in the Reformation, I just want to read the, this introduction to the sacrament of the altar from the large catechism. You're probably very familiar with the small catechism. But take a listen here to the large. And maybe this part is is overlooked often because it's kind of the intro before you get to the meat. But listen to this. Just as we heard about holy baptism, so we must also speak about the other sacrament. In these same three points, what is it? What are its benefits? And who is to receive it? Right? And all these points are established through the words by which Christ has instituted the sacrament. Now, here we go. Everyone who desires to be a Christian and go to this sacrament, the Lord's Supper, should know these three points. What were they again? What is it? What are its benefits? And who is to receive it? For it is not our intention to let people come to the sacrament and administer it to them if they do not know what they seek or why they come. There we go. Right away. The Lord's Supper is closed in the Lutheran heritage. It's closed in the Christian heritage, but just for you wondering if it's a Lutheran thing, yes, it has always been a Lutheran thing. Why? Because we don't want someone taking something that they don't understand. This is just like a, a pharmacist would never give you medicine without first giving you a consultation, making sure you understand what it is you're receiving and taking. It's common sense. This is something that can do you great good if received rightly. It's something that can do you great harm if taken carelessly. And if you don't understand what it is you're receiving, you don't just take pills without knowing what they do to you. You don't just take the Lord's body and blood without knowing what it's doing to you, right? Craziness to think otherwise. Crazy. All right. Now, let me take these last parting minutes, as long as I have left, to tell you how you can get a copy, your own copy free of a simple explanation of fellowship in the Lord's Supper. How are you going to get this done? Very simple. The first 10 people to go over to my Instagram account, that's instagram.com forward slash Tyrell Bramwell, or if you're already on Instagram, it's the at sign, right? At Tyrell Bramwell, that's my handle. Go find a picture of the, the, the pamphlet. I posted one on Friday. It's the only book on my feed since I refreshed it. Find it, and uh, I want you to comment on there that you would like to receive a copy of this little pamphlet, and then share the post with someone. And the first 10 people who do that will get a copy sent to them. I'll DM you afterwards. I'll get your address and I'll mail it to you myself. All right, there it is. It's as simple as that. I hope you enjoy it. And it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Make sure you come back next week for more Cross Defense. And in the meantime, stick around KFUO.org and listen to our other great programming. And I will talk to you very soon from... The Crossroads of America. Adios.
Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.